I'm going to start by talking about security just to make sure that we're all kind of on, uh, have a, a, an understanding of why security has risen in policy making circles in this space. Uh, I'll also get to give us a little bit of the history of some of the incidents that I uh, was unfortunate enough to uh, live through when I was in the White House over the last two and a half years. I left about uh, five months ago. So um, I go, it goes, this goes, you know, about two and a half to two and a half years before that. Um, and then go into from there how that ties into setting standards in this space and why people started to care about standards in this space. Um, so let's start with, you know, on the security side. Um, I think it's uh, pretty, well, pretty well established at this point that the security threats are real in this space. Uh, there are still a few people out there that sort of say it's not that big of a problem, um, as you might think. But it is, uh, there are real costs to it uh, in terms of, of, of drawing back from uh, innovation in terms of uh, the cost to the two companies involved that need to secure themselves and certainly after a breach, which is what this slide gets at. Um, the, 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 this is the, uh, information that comes from both Verizon and the ID Theft Resource Center. I kind of merged them together. Um, and the, the red line is uh, things that come from hacking, skimming, and phishing. So what we tr traditionally would think of as uh, um, hacking in this space and, and that hacking that you see. These others are... Um, things that are like accident, accidental spillage, right, of, of data. And you see from 2007 to today that the, the kind of third party coming in and, uh, um, and incidents, incidents that come from third parties uh, involved has gone way up uh, in this space. Uh, it's still costing about the same as what it's cost all along, uh, about $35 million per incident. They, they, it, but uh, it's, it's really based on the n amount that you spend per record, really, when you're talking about personal data. So that, that $201 is like how you much you know, how, what kind of risk you have in the space, how many records you have, multiply it by $201, there's your risk, right? Um, and then um, right now, about 40%, you know, looking at this chart, caused by malicious or, or criminal attack. Um, and I only really like the word attack, which is why I put it in quotes, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, the... Uh, uh, just, just to give a sense here, to, to make sense of the way that I did the rest of these slides, basically break up threat actors into three categories. So hacktivists, so people that are trying to send a message of some kind in what they do. Um, there are, there's fraud and organized crime, trying to steal money. Um, and then there's nation states that are trying to get information, traditional espionage or economic espionage of some kind. Um, so I'm going to talk about the last two categories and the incidents that we lived through there. Um, some people add insider threat to this group. I, I usually think insider threat is you're usually doing one of these other three things uh, if you are an insider, right? You're, you're either doing traditional espionage, you're trying to steal for money, or you're trying to make a point when you've stolen and you post it up online or something. Uh, so uh, I would... Uh, I put those folks in that category. So um, here are incidents nations that where nation states were involved. Um, these are all government agencies that were hit uh, at different times um, over the past two and a half years. Uh, the White House being the first um, and that I have on here. Uh, and I didn't put the associated nation state with it. Now almost all of them have been publicly identified by the Director of National Intelligence. So I feel a little bit more comfortable talking about some of those. Um, the, uh, the, uh, but there, they, all, all of them have been identified by some uh, government uh, employee, government off official, uh, unnamed. Uh, so they're all out there publicly. Um, the White House one was one that uh, is generally attributed to being Russia. The Director of National Intelligence is named Russia. Um, usually, if you, as you'll see, there's sort of a pattern where the Russia name ones, you, you see like a, this traditional espionage where they're trying to get email. Um, th the second one, the Postal Service, uh, that's 800,000 employees and 2.9 million customers uh, were affected, and that, is, that was uh, China. China t tends to go after large data sets and just tries to pull down information from large data sets. Um, so Department of State, unclassified email, attributed to Russia. Office of Personal Management, the biggest one, 22.5 million individuals, lots of personal information involved, China. Um, Joint Chiefs of Staff, email system again, Russia. So you see a pattern there. Um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff one, which didn't get that much attention, to me is actually the, the scariest one because 
The Joint Chiefs of Staff know what they're doing, and their mail server uh, was, got hit. They knew immediately that the mail server got hit. It took them two weeks to clean their unclassified mail server. And they know what they're doing, right? So uh, that's what, what kind of defense can someone that's being hit by the same thing that doesn't really know what they're doing have uh, when the folks that know what they're doing, it takes them two weeks to make sure that it's clean. Um, other incidents, so these are commercial incidents, and here we get, it's a little more interesting uh, of the thinking and the reasoning behind uh, some of the incidents here. So here you had, see, we start to see some costs, so $40 million estimated cost to Sands Casino, which was hit in uh, February 2014. Um, that one I actually do consider to be an attack. The, the other ones I call it more incidents, because um, an attack to me is when, when hardware breaks and when uh, things are just not usable anymore versus just taking data, which is considered to be some kind of espionage or, or theft. Um, and in the, the SANS case, you're talking about, um, you actually had network, the whole network was, the whole networks were wiped, computers were bricked. Um, SSNs were also taken, right? There was that, that piece as well. Um, does anyone know what country has been named in this incident? It's Iran, because the, the owner of the SANS casino is Sheldon Adelson, who uh, may, has made public comments negative to Iran, and he, they decided uh, that they didn't like that, so they took it out on his company. Um, similar thing happened with Sony, as most people know at this point, right? The president actually attributed this one himself. Um, so Sony, the Sony case is attributed to North Korea. Um, and there you have, uh, th they also uh, shut down networks, uh, brick computers, uh, had SSN's date of birth information taken, released movies online, tried to basically just do as much as they could to uh, embarrass the company because they didn't like the idea that they were releasing this, the, the movie, the interview. Um, so uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, in that case. And then in Anthem, again, you have 80 million records involved, um, class action lawsuits here, uh, lots of pain to the different companies involved. Happened to a lot of health companies. Anyone know what country this one was? I'll give you a hint, lots of data stolen about every American. China, right. So again, this, the, the, we can see the, the pattern here. Um, then you also have these organized crime cases that people know pretty well. Target, Home Depot. You have J.P. Morgan Chase, which I think of as being a really interesting one because J.P. Morgan Chase blamed the Russians immediately, and the government said, no, it's not the Russians, it's criminal actors, and they had a fight about it back and forth because if it is the... If it's a nation state, right, then it's the government's job to help them clean their systems. If it's a criminal, then they get some law enforcement help, but it's the, their own job to, to protect themselves. So there, that, goes, that type of attribution piece goes back and forth. Uh, it turned out that what they were doing was they were trying to collect email addresses from wealthy individuals that they know would invest in things, and it was a pump and dump scheme where they would tell them to invest in something coming from an authoritative source. Then they invest in it, and then they... Then, uh, the, the bad guys sell their stock, and then they, they uh, get off. So they, it was, a, it was a, a traditional pump and dump scheme done in a completely untraditional way uh, involving hacking. Uh, and then we have the IRS uh, scheme from May of 2015, uh, which is similarly convoluted, uh, where they stole the people's 990s, not 990s, their uh, 1040s, 1040s, right, they're, 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 uh, they're filing from the 990s, the... Uh, uh, Nonprofit one, but this, these were of individuals. So the 1040s, they stole their 1040 forms. They're old forms, right? Because you can request your old tax forms back to see for yourself. So they requested their old forms. Um, they, they got enough information about them to request their old forms. Use that to file new um, tax forms that wouldn't trip up the fraud, fraud detection. All they did was change the address, kept basically all the same da old data. Um, so when they filed the new forms, they filed very, right at the beginning of the tax season, and they were paid off, and, and they were given uh, tax refunds for these individuals. When the individuals went to go file, they, they already had things filed in their name. Happened to 600,000 people. So, uh, and there's a lot going on in that case as well still. So again, there's some reality to this situation here, <laughs> where a lot of cases are, are happening here. Um, I, I like this Verizon uh, because I think it demonstrates kind of the thinking in this case, which is these are so th these are the w w the the number the the types of exploits that were used by year, right? So in 2014, 
99.9% of the cases that they saw, that Verizon saw, could have been stopped if somewhere along the chain, right, somewhere, somewhere along, something was picked up, right, that we know exists as a um, known vulnerability today. Um, I think they do count phishing in some cases, so from what I know, uh, based on the report itself. So I think they do. So obviously phishing is a little bit, you know, it's questionable. But, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of other things, and maybe the number is not 99.9, .9, but there's some percentage. Uh, the, the idea here is that these, so go, the, the exploits go all the way back that were used go all the way back to 1999. Some of them have people have known about for a really long time, but people are still not putting the things in place to stop them. So that, that, and that's the policy question that's really at hand here is um, there is this kind of world of kind of zero days and how do we go about stopping zero days, but there's also this general space of uh, that most of what goes on there, people know how is, is, uh, are security um, risks that exist, that have existed for a long time, but people are not putting in place the basic protections that they need to stop them. How do we go about getting people to do kind of the basics that we expect them to do, right? And that's kind of the starting place for the, the broader discussion. So now we're going to back to uh, part two of this discussion, which is uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Go back to 1901, uh, right? That, that, that's when the NIST was created. It was originally called the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, and the idea was that as we started to see more interstate commerce, mostly through the trains, right? So it's the first time you have trains, you have uh, telegraph working, you have um, a lot more information traveling back and forth and ability to get goods and services to people um, from one city to another city inside the United States, interstate, real interstate commerce. Um, you start to see that um, things don't really measure up the same way in Philadelphia and New York and Washington and Boston and things going up the train line, they get a, a gallon of milk in Boston is not the same as a gallon of milk in New York, right? Which is hard to picture in our heads right now, but here is, this is my, my favorite picture. From it. This is in Seattle, right? So their scales were all off because they were using the, the weights and measures from Seattle at the time, right? I think this was like 1914, so this is, it took a while for this to get implemented, right? These are all the um, old scales that the Weights and Measures Bureau of, of Washington State had confiscated because they were no longer valid, right? They were based on the old measurements that were being used. For, so, so all of Seattle's measurements were wrong compared to the rest of the United States, so they had to go back and remove the scales from all these places. Um, so to make sure that they were updated with new scales by some point. Um, and that's really what NIST is, and that's really what standards are, are. It's about measurement, right? We tend to think of technical standards in different terms, but technical standards are basically the same thing. It's all about measurement. Um, so in this case, electri uh, electricity, length, mass, temperature, light, time, all those pieces are things that NIST started to measure at that point in time. Um, at, at the time that it was created in 1901, Germany and the UK actually had the best measurement uh, um, administrations in the world, and ours was way down. And uh, there was a feeling that there was a big push to say, we need to have the best measurement in the United States if we're going to really be, have um, interstate commerce work and inter be able to trade internationally. Uh, and there was a push at that time, and that's really what uh, drove the creation of NIST, but it also really did, we really did become the standard setter uh, for, uh, for this. For, so, for example, time right now, when, when, when we measure time, it is done um, based on a, uh, a, the most advanced clock in the world, which is in Boulder, Colorado, and it held at NIST University, and it's put together by physicists, um, and, and f there are five physicists currently at NIST that won the Nobel Prize, and almost all of them ended up working somehow on that clock, right? So you're talking about extremely advanced laboratories that are um, tied to uh, the idea of pure measurement in this space. Um, so then, how does NIST get involved in security, right, and safety? And this goes back to three years after NIST creation. There was a, the great fire, Baltimore Fire of 1904, 
And this is like stuff of NIST legend, like everyone that goes through, like I had, I, I got uh, my first day at NIST, they, you know, they, br they brought in some guy who used to work at NIST in the 20s, and he came and he gave a talk, he's like 95 years old, and he, he was talking about the Great Fire of 1904. So, um, 19, the Great Fire of 1904, they, um, they had um, the, uh, uh, it was the first time that, th that there were these, that there were fire departments from different cities that could actually get to a fire on time in another city. So but they knew this fire in Baltimore was going on and on and was going to get bigger and bigger. They sent in Philadelphia, Annapolis, and Washington, D.C. Uh, on the train to bring fire trucks. That's what fire trucks used to look like back then, right there, uh, which is why I used that picture. Um, and they, they got the, all their equipment off the train, got them to the place they need to be, and they went to hook in the hoses, and the hoses, the thread on the hoses did not match the thread on the hydrants. So completely unusable. Um, and that is how NIST ended up working on uh, safety standards, really. Uh, the, the first efforts were all about fire, and they did it. Uh, almost all the building codes that we use today are based on NIST standards that then get incorporated into local building code standards. Um, everything that insurance companies use, basically, the standards that they use are based on some set of NIST standards that, the, that, are, that have been incorporated into those pieces. Um, they, the, um, the, you know, this, they have, this is from a uh, NIST publication from the, from the teens um, I think the late teens, uh, which is like how to use a fire extinguisher, they use that. One thing that NIST does that that's, uh, was really weird to me is they, they make standard reference material. So um, the, I'll, I'll give an ex a measurement example first. Right? They make uh, a jar of peanut butter. Right? And the jar of peanut butter is used to, for testing labs that count calories and fat to say, to calibrate their equipment, right? They stick the measurement and tool into that. They know that this, this jar of peanut butter has been tested on seven or eight machines at NIST that all had the same readings. When it gets to you, your machine should have the same reading. If it doesn't, you recalibrate your machine to this jar of peanut butter, right? Um, so what they did here was they, they, they've done things like they have standard reference tools like a standard cigarette that burns at a certain amount of time, and therefore, you can test fire, fireproof materials, fire safety things to that cigarette, right? And the idea is it has to be repeatable. It has to be measurable, right? It has to be based on consensus industry standards, right? People in industry have to all agree. It has to be international, right? And that's, those are really the key pieces. Um, and now there's actually a lot more policy around how to do these international standards, uh, obviously, than there was then, but even in the last five or six years, there's been a lot more effort to try and internationalize um, the standard making process in this space and what standards are acceptable from what bodies for, for uh, NIST to take in and use. So on computer security, you know, it's a little bit different in terms of measurement, right? We don't think of um, computer security as a fundamentally measurable area, um, but it is things that where there is repeatability involved. and. Um, the, it started, really, the NIST rule started in 1977, and that was around um, encryption and encryption policy. Uh, really, at that point, every company had, every, every computer, major computer company, of which there were probably five, right, Honeywell and IBM and the, those kind of companies, NEC, right, those kind of companies all had their, um, their own proprietary encryption that they would use. And... What the problem was then you couldn't get pieces of data to speak to each other because they're all using uh, different kinds of different flavors of encryption. Um, so it made it very difficult to have programs work together that were really secure. What NIST ended up doing was it had a contest, li literally a, a math contest, right, where they brought in um, the, the, the different kinds of encryption, and they chose the best one, who happened to be the one created by IBM, um, and they called it uh, the digital encryption standard. Um, and then that became the standard for the, federal, for the federal government and for basically anyone that worked with the federal government. So most of the companies ended up using it as well. Um, and the companies were willing to live with this idea of, like, we're going to lose our proprietary standard in this space 
in order to get something that then we can create something to and have everyone work in and know that we're working with the best encryption in the world. Uh, and that, that, that has become kind of the way that the, the, the encryption is done internationally. I mean, people use the NIST standards internationally to base standards of encryption. Now, there's a, a few different kinds of encryption out there. It's not just uh, what, what the one that NIST puts forward, but, it is, uh, but the NIST one does have a certain kind of relevance uh, among the community that others don't have. Um, they, they, so this machine, the, 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 they, they just moved this, uh, the old uh, digital encryption standard machine to the museum at NIST, and they told me that it saved tons of lab space when they moved it because it was so big uh, and so clunky. So um, there was also, so, and, and from that, there, the NIST started this role that has really become um, kind of embedded in, and now it's embedded in law, uh, that NIST sets the standards for the federal government. Um, and from now you have all these spe special publications that NIST puts out where they, where they really lay out all the different kinds of um, security standards, right, that are repeatable, measurable, et cetera, um, in, in the security space. Um, those were really done in kind of categories, uh, but um, you still have lots of different kinds of standards out there um, in this space, and most industries ended up using some forms of them, but also adding their own s standards on top of it. Uh, and you had a, a mishmash where people were using similar terms to mean different things or different terms to mean the same thing. Um, so when you get companies that are multi in, in multi-sectors or you have a company that is now working, a security company working across different sectors, they have to translate all this into different places. Um, and that brings us to, uh, in 2013, uh, President Obama signed a new executive order that would create this, si this si new cybersecurity framework. Right? And the idea of the framework was to say, we're going to take all these different standards from all these different sectors and put them into a new um, set of basic uh, categories, or you can think of them as principles, right, by which we organize them that work across all of the different sectors. And then there's, so there are, there's functions, categories, subcategories, and then informative references. So the functions are the, um, the, the main five things. So identifying uh, what you have on your network, right? Protecting that, being able to protect that, so standards around protecting it. Um, and then detect, respond, recover, which are sort of a sim all a similar vein. So the first two are about the defensive side, and then the, 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 the um, detect, respond, recover side is after you've been hit, after you've had an incident, what do you do? How do you detect it? How do you respond to it? And how can you recover from it? You know, what are your backups? What are your plans? Things like that. So in each of these, cat in each of these functions, there are a number, a long number of categories that are based on all the different kinds of, of things you need to do to identify and protect and detect and, and respond and recover within each of those categories. And then there are subcategories which, which actually then um, point to some more, specific, more detailed specifics. And then you have the informative references. When the informative references are the actual standards that exist today, so the ISO standards, the um, IEEE standards, you know, which are the, who make the um, hardware electronic standards, um, or the um, IETF standards, or the um, uh, W3C standards, et cetera. Sometimes they're NIST standards themselves um, that point back to exactly what we're talking about in this space. And sometimes there are even things that are just for the oil industry or just for the, ele uh, the electric sector or just for government, right? But it still all ties back to you know, how you go about doing this. So you have this framework now that goes down because before we would always come up with a solution for a specific problem in the space but it didn't tie back up to say, here's what everyone should, should, how everyone should protect themselves. So something in the oil and gas sector may end up uh, in the future affecting someone in the, uh, in, in the hospital space, right? And you have to be able to know how you're gonna go about doing it in both spaces so you can, you can map it back up and back down again. Um, it's really been, a, the, the framework's really been a great success in that it's become kind of the, uh, as uh, um, MasterCard CEO is call it the Rosetta Stone for cybersecurity. You can look at one, use it in another place. Um, so you can ha come up with assessments that people can understand that are basically the same across different sectors. Um, and you can rise it up, up to the point to having this discussion about standards, even with management people that don't want to get into the details about how the different standards work for the first time. Uh, and now it's been embedded into law um, as well that this standard is going to, that this framework is going to continue to exist and be updated regularly.
So now NIST is trying to do a pretty much similar thing, but in the privacy engineering space. Um, and there, right, in the privacy space, you sort of have the opposite problem. So privacy has always had the set of, this high set of principles, the fair information practice principles, but it doesn't really have those measurable, repeatable standards the same way that security does. So the question is, how do you drill down from that top layer of principles into this set of standards? Um, it's going to be a lot more complicated of a problem, but if you map it out first and say, here's what we need, and here are the kinds of standards we need in each of these, these, these areas. So in other words, access. How do we know that people can measurably act and, and repeatedly a um, access their own data uh, and then and be secure and private as they're doing it? And, uh, and, and uh, change it and bring it, put it back, right? What are the standards for that that can be done in that way? Today, a standard doesn't exist. But now if someone, if someone creates that, you know where to put it inside this framework, right? So it's a, it's a larger task to take on, but you can sort of see the, uh, the, how it's going to work because we have the security mo role model there out in, in the wild on the, in this space. So uh, that's kind of the next step that NIST is really starting to embark on. A lot of industry people are really concerned about it because um, they feel as though it's going to lead to privacy regulation down the road uh, in this space. But um, until you have the standards there, it's sort of hard to see th that vision <laughs> can't sort of come together in that way. So uh, um, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that maps out. So with that, I'm happy to take questions on any of these pieces, privacy, security, standards. That's pretty close to what we thought, right? Thanks. <laughs> Great. Well, well, th thank you, Art. And, and before we go to questions, I, I've, I've got one for you. And, and sure. that, that was a great overview using kind of your work on cybersecurity as kind of a framework for how things get done at NIST. But at, at, at just one step higher than that, you know, we, we kind of know how a bill becomes a law. How does a standard come to be typically? Like, what's the, you know, how does it? So, get usually it's someone in industry that says, I have a best practice, right? And people hate the term best practice now for to mean standards, but I think in this case, it still really is a best practice, right? You come up with something that you think is really good, other people are using it, right? And it's something that there's not a real proprietary uh, feeling over. You don't feel as though this is what drives my, my business. It's something that we use to protect things, et cetera. And it's something that it can be shown to be measurable, repeatable. So then you bring that to a standards body, right? NIST is in some ways a standards body, but in some ways it, it more pulls from other standards bodies instead. So um, there is not today a security standards body out there for uh, computer security. They mostly use um, the in existing internet um, bodies and they have which have security wings. So if it, it depends on what part of the protocol system it, 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 what you're talking about, right, where you bring that to. So let's say that it's something on the web, right, and then and um, the, um, the W3C, right, is the web standard setting body, um, which is run by Tim Berners-Lee out of MIT, right, and people bring uh, a standard to the, to the W3C, uh, usually member companies, right, it will bring a, a standard there, um, that then it goes through a process by which they, they give people time to update it, et cetera. Um, and then it gets approved by the member companies, um, voted in by the member companies, and then uh, there's final approval by a, um, the leadership of the W3C, uh, and then it becomes an official W3C standard, right? Um, so, and then when it's the official W3C standard, then it can be incorporated into a NIST reference, it can be incorporated into an international standards body reference, right, an ISO standard, for example. We're a little confusing in the US side of things because most, uh, most foreign governments, most governments in the world, I should put it that way, most governments in the world have a official standard setting body that represents them at the international standards bodies. We don't do that. Industry represents the US there, and, the U and NIST is just a player among industry in representing us. So we use ANSI, right, this, uh, uh, a, uh, a standard setting body that um, uh, is a nonprofit, right, to represent us at international bodies, and this just kind of pitches its standards or it gives it and gives its expertise. Uh, has a big say in what they do, but, they, that, but ANSI actually runs it. It's similar, actually, with measurement standards, too. Um, in measurement standards, most of the governments do the, the weights, have a weights and measures division that then declares something a standard. We actually have this national conference for weights and measures 
that NIST is an advisor to, right, and NIST actually set up, um, but actually has all of the industry involved in it and has all of the weights and measures, regulators in all the states and, and, and cities, and they all go in and they pitch in. So, uh, and they come up with a standard, say this is a new standard, it goes into the standard set process in the US, then it becomes an international standard, and it goes to the International Conference of Weights and Measures, which has all these other bodies in, involved in it. So uh, there's a long process to get to that point of being an international standard, um, and traditionally in the um, weights and measures category, it could take 20 years. For technical standards, it can be done in six months if it's something that's m widely, widely uh, um, in embraced as a, as a widely used practice as really as an industry standard even before it's a officially um, stamped with the industry standard uh, uh, seal, so. Great, so uh, two, two other questions actually. Um, one, in the technology space or somewhere else, are there standards that, like a normal person wouldn't like, there, you wouldn't know? Like, there's a standard for that. Any kind of examples of a standard that the, in the, the common person in the technical might space, or in, the in, in the technical space, or, or or in other spaces where you just kind of go, okay, yeah, there's a standard for for that. Any examples there? I mean, everything's standardized, right? I mean, that's I mean, especially on the internet, right? That's how you communicate. Is is through standards, so it's really hard to come up with something that, in my mind, is something that people wouldn't know is standardized. I mean, I think uh, you know if you, it, so you think of, I mean, just like every every interaction, right? Has you're you're passing about twelve different standards just to get information back and forth on the on the internet, right? Like you know, um, the the get pro like a get request on the on the um, on the web is a standard, right? It's based on the how the request is written. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's just like, so one that I'm working on that's sort of weird is, uh, and it's, it's, it's becoming more of a technical standard, but it's actually a, uh, um, uh, 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 less so is, uh, it, it started as a measurement standard is, you know, taxi cab meters, right? Taxi cab meters are standardized through the National Council of Weights and Measures originally set forward by NIST, right? Um, where NIST said, this is, here is what we suggest, the National Conservation Measure approves it. Um, and everyone around the country uh, ha basically uses the same taxi cab measure, ta taxi cab meter measurement that's tied back to that n measurement that NIST came up with, right? Like, I mean, there's just a whole bunch of things that you don't really, that happen in a day-to-day -day life um, that you don't really think of as like having a government federal government seal of approval, but they, because it doesn't, right, it's done at the state and local level, but it's all tied back to a national standard so that when people go to different cities, they're basically being measured the same way. So in, 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 you know, in all your time in, in Washington, you know, working in your various roles and then, you know, g going over and, and spending some, some time, you know, kind of working different things through NIST, um, any big takeaways from that experience? Was it, I mean, do, do you think the process works, works relatively well, and any kind of surprised about how many different stakeholders there were, any, any, any big takeaways? I mean, I think it works, works really, really well when um, folks see a desire to get together and work together, and there's not really like, it's not, there's not so much of a threat of regulation that people just feel as though they can't, uh, they can't in, in get involved in space, but there's enough of a threat of regulation that they're willing to get into a room together in order to have the discussion. Um, so I, I feel like at the two extremes where regulate, there's too much discussion about regulation, people just want to throw, say no to any idea that comes out because they're afraid that it's going to turn into regulation. But if there's not enough of a, of a like, that this is the idea that this is a real problem that government is eventually going to pick up if you don't do something about it, then people don't feel the need to spend time and energy and money uh, solving the problem. So there's a balance between the two, especially in, on internet issues. Great. Hey, anybody have questions? And, and we'll just pass around the mic. Thanks. Uh, you t spent a while talking about the threat model in the security setting, uh, cybersecurity. Can you talk a little bit about the current thoughts around the threat model on the privacy side? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, so I think that the feeling on the privacy side is still that consumer, con generally, Consumers, it, uh, first of all, there's, there's a piece of it that's tied together, right? I mean, it, you're, most of the, what I was talking about was data breaches, which, which are privacy, both privacy and security issues. But um, 
I think from the from the pure privacy side of you know you think of security as as in um, things that uh, you do to where, where the company wants to protect the data and the consumer wants the data they're protected as well and whereas the privacy side being that consumers don't necessarily know what's happening to their data behind the scenes and may not like it right that's where the privacy the, the control over your own data piece of it, uh, it comes in um, the I think the, the feeling on the threat on the privacy side is that there's just a ever-growing feeling from consumers that they don't know what's happening to their, to their information. Um, and the fact that companies um, have means of showing that through transparency and they don't necessarily do it, um, or giving, a cons giving means of consent or you know, other, other kinds of protections in place, and there's not really standards around that right? To, in order to let people uh, demonstrate that that consent, et cetera. So uh, that's really where the a lot of the the issues come come around is just this feeling this feeling that you you don't know what's happening to your data behind the scenes. You also think of data brokers as being the thing to protect against. Um, I think there's a lot of different things that, that that people are concerned about. I mean, data brokers are sort of complicated in that they're a third party that's involved, so you know they they get that information. But I think it's even true for a first relation, single relationship between the consumer and a company or organization that then takes in the information and does stuff with it. And people don't really understand um, well what's just happened to my data, or um, you know, and, and they don't trust that it's being used in in ways that to, to help them be protected. Yes, in, in the privacy space, and that's really what makes it a little bit different. So, yes. Uh, this question kind of builds on that a little yeah. bit. Um, you had mentioned that a lot of these standard setting bodies are sort of run with um, sort of representatives from the you know big tech corporations, and I'm wondering sort of what the role is and uh, for sort of individuals or sort of consumer advocacy organizations. Do they also participate in these these meetings and d these decisions and how to So this work? is uh, this is an ongoing discussion, right? I mean, it is a set of stakeholders that are involved, and sometimes. Um, you know, there have been cases in, where there have been people try to build standards around privacy in particular, where a lot of st stakeholders that weren't companies got involved, and it was, the standards didn't really go very far <laughs> because the companies didn't feel as though they needed to implement the thing that all these, cons these consumer groups were telling them to implement versus what they wanted to do themselves. Um, there have been, however, you know, there are a number of cases where consumer, some consumer groups or individuals have worked on some sets of standards that have actually helped it push it over the line and get it done. So I think there's th the two different uh, versions of that. Um, but there has been this kind of, at least for the past 15 years, uh, ongoing discussion of how do we get more civil society voices into the standard setting process and make it work. Um, I feel pretty good about the way the cybersecurity framework did that, you know, as someone that helped to develop that process. Um, they, there was a lot of effort in trying to get uh, consumer voices in the room and uh, hearing what they had said and individuals that had certain things to say, they had a, a, a way to go about doing that and getting them into the process um, and be heard on that. So I, I, I think that uh, you can devise secure standard processes that do that. Um, most standard setting bodies though are set up for companies, right? And that's the way that they're set up. So there has to be this kind of question about, well, what's, how do we get Consumer voices or individual voices into those discussions that are, are this 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 uh, standard setting forum. And I'm going to play on that one as yeah. well. Um, IDESG, the yes. Identity Ecosystem Standard. So that's that's an example, as I understand it, of, of consciously bringing industry and government, you know, instinct from NIST together. Yes. And I I keep hearing that that's not going very far. There are a lot of conversations that are not being constructive. I wondered if you could speak to some how you see that and some thoughts on how to make that stronger. And then also just if you could talk about identity verification and entity verification maybe a little more generally because I think it also plays over into the blockchain side. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me, so the, the IDSG is a uh, body that was set up out of this national strategy for trust identities in cyberspace, um, which the president signed in order to help move forward the idea of uh, identity management. And, and improving identity management in a way that um, wasn't tied to a single identity for a single individual um, on the web and, and on the internet in general. So um, let, me, let me just take a level up from just that discussion first and then we can talk more about identity management. Um, I can, let's see if I can do this without making uh, Frank's eyes roll. But uh, the, um, 
This is really a discussion, the discussion you're bringing up is really a discussion about how multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. organizations work, right? Um, there's been this big push in the past uh, seven years or so to say we need to do m less through regulation and more through multi-stakeholder organizations. Um, and um, there's kind of several different ways to go about building multi-stakeholder organizations. Um, so Pat Gallagher, who was uh, the director of NIST and now is a, a chancellor at Pitt University, um, used to say to me that uh, you know, our job at NIST is to have a uh, potluck dinner, right? And we uh, invite, we set, up, we, set up the, we set up the, we let anyone come. There's no real invite list. Uh, but we set up the menu. We set the table for people. We um, tell people, these are the categories at which we need. We need people to sign up. Please sign up to, to get things done and make sure that we can fill all the categories. Um, and here's the date that we're going to have the dinner, right? Um, that, in, the, in this cybersecurity framework space, was extremely successful. Like, they laid out, uh, they did it very well. Um, there are other processes, IDSG, tends to do it a little, tend to be a little bit heavier handed in this space of saying, here's exactly what we need to do, here are the dates we need to do it by, um, you're gonna bring this, you're gonna bring that, you're gonna bring that, you're gonna come to the table, and uh, that's how we're gonna move it forward. And people say, hold up, wait, 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 we're not ready to go there yet, let's have a discussion about, you know, in, in the, uh, bring, bring it back to the uh, Pollock dinner, like, how many desserts do we need? How many appetizers do we need? Who do, who's bringing the drinks? Wait, you forgot about the napkins, right? So there's sort of this, discuss, this ongoing discussion in that group about the process, right? And, um, le and, and less of it on, like, let's focus on the standards for identity management, right? And, and how we go about addressing these issues, uh, at least in my opinion of, how, of why that, got to, that went that way. Meanwhile, there are these other multi-stakeholder processes on privacy that NTIA is running, and those have run into this problem of, we're not gonna tell you, it's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. We're not gonna tell you exactly what dates the deadlines are, we're not gonna tell you exactly who should do what, we're just gonna set the, sit, have everyone sit in the room together, and they're gonna figure it out together. And there you end up having the, just the same policy discussion over and over and over again, right? And the question is, how do you get bring that, that a step further to say, you know, how can we go into a little bit more detail here to have, uh, to move this, that discussion forward? So it's kind of three different views on, why, on to setting up, and they're set up, and, and there are policy reasons each of those were set up the way that they were. I mean, there was a feeling in the IDSG when that was set up that we have all the standards here already. We have companies that are raring to go, but we just need to get sign off that everyone's gonna do it the same way. So they felt that they could push a little harder. They turned out to be like, th that didn't help speed things along in any way, really. Um, and they probably should have you know, done it a different way, but I mean, it was industry actually that decided on that structure in some ways. So you gotta, uh, you know, that just turned out not to be right. So, um, but you know, you gotta end up picking which way is the right way. Yes, I didn't talk about identity management at all, but that's okay. Uh, this kind of builds off that, but I wanted to ask about um, electronic voting and voting on the internet. Yeah. And sort of uh, what you see as the main barriers to that and, and how much progress we can make and how. The main problem with it is that the risks to internet voting are very, very large, right? And so even though the um, the probability of uh, an incident that will would um, cause the, the, the kind of the high-end risk of it um, uh, is is not that large just the idea that um, we move to this new structure makes people very uncomfortable so that's one issue the other issue is w one of the big problems has been with all of these is there's not the the discoverability of the incidents until after the, ca the case, and then you don't really know how large they've been. So there's always going to there's this lack of trust of if we move things to internet voting, are we actually going to be able to know when an incident has occurred? The, the detect, respond, recover. You know, are we going to actually be able to know that, a, that, a, that an incident has occurred? If we do know, 
are we going to be able to stop it from happening or get it, fix things very, very quickly when we really only have a very short period of time to do so, because that's the voting period, and then can we even recover from it at all, right? And I think so, I think those three things really have um, made people extremely uncomfortable with the idea of online voting. I mean, uh, I would point you to Lori Craner's work on this. I don't know if she's ever given a data bite, but you should have her. Uh, at some point. She, right now she's the FTC's uh, chief technology officer, but normally she's at Carnegie Mellon. And so she's she, uh, she went in with this idea like, we can make online voting happen. And then after her, you know, as her work evolved, it sort of got more and more negative toward the idea of online voting to whereas now she's like, I don't know if we're ever gonna, really ever gonna get there. Um, and I think that that's sort of the evolution that um, a lot of people that, that are real security experts that are also real um, open internet, you know, people want to see more people involved in the process kind of come to is this might not be the best route to go. So um, I don't claim to be an expert in the area, but the, you know, Avi Rubin's another one at Johns Hopkins. He's written, he's, he wrote a book about this and basically came to the same conclusion as well. So. Thank you for the great presentation. Sure. I have a question with respect to the interaction of um, NIST with the crypto community. Oh, yeah. Um, there's been two issues. One is with NSTIC last year, they published a paper saying that basically everybody could be tracked in a way that would be against the main principles of a good identity management. And so it, the way that crypto was not used in the design would basically make everyone's identities linkable in a way that was unacceptable. And I'm not sure how the response was. And that was kind of the first disappointment of the security community. And the second one was, I guess, with NSA and, and the uh, meddling with the um, crypto standards. So I wonder like, how you're right now dealing as NIST with this um, important community for privacy and yeah. cybersecurity. Um, Again, I don't work in NIST, and I'm right, not representing that, NIST How here, is NIST so. dealing with this? Um, how is the industry dealing with this? So I think on NSTIC, I think things on NSTIC, if you actually read the actual NSTIC document and the privacy pieces that go with it, I think people took some quotes out of context and don't really, didn't really tie it to the actual set of goals for NSTIC. Right, so, people looked at the design and showed that there was actually, but, but it was NSTIC, possible as, to... As a design, right? Right. NSTIC is designed to use any technology, right? That's the goal of NSTIC is to use any technology. Now, some people, you can pull one pilot out of it and say, this pilot was not designed in the way that the, the goals of NSTIC were, were set forward, right? And I agree with that, right? The, I think you can do that, and then people can criticize it that way. But that just shows that it didn't meet their, they didn't meet their goals, right? I don't think it shows bad intent on the part of the people from N who, who put together NSTIC. So that's my, I mean, that's my own viewpoint, and knowing them and knowing you know, how they feel about the, the different issues there. But I understand that the, there are people that feel differently about that. Um, I think that the, the crypto issue is a more, much more serious matter because it goes back to, there's actually a long history with this, um, which is when the Clipper chip was uh, first put forward in 1992, a lot of people said, we're going to get NIST involved in creating the Clipper chip, and then industry will be okay with it. And NIST was kind of like, we don't really want to do that, and they said, but you're going to do it. Um, and so NIST's name got put on everything. Um, even though it didn't really happen, people sort of said, well, you know, how come NIST couldn't, you know, rebel enough in that case. Then you had the Snowden um, uh, releases and, and where some of them talked about the NSA, um, you know, pushing things through through the NIST process and this NISTy thing that they were going to do. Um, like, you know, there were quotes in there that basically made it sound like they were subverting, the, the NSA was subverting the NIST process and by law, NSA, NIST has to consult with NSA on its work, right? I mean, that's in the law. That in, for NIST's operating statute, they must con uh, work with NSA. Now, NSA does happen to have a lot of great cryptologists, <laughs> cryptographers, but, and, and uh, has done a lot of work um, in a positive way on encryption, encryption, uh, in, on encryption from a mathematical sense. However, if that starts to bleed over into the policy, if that starts to bleed over into the standards, it causes a huge problem. Um, and um, I think the folks at NIST that work on encryption were truly horrified by the, what, what NSA was writing. Um, there, there, there have been a number of bills that actually say that NIST should just not have to consult at all with NSA, and that's a back and forth thing. As of right now, they still have to under law, um, so they don't have a choice. But what they did do was they got together a group of 
well-known cryptographers, well-known uh, in focus in industry that work on these policies, and try to bring them together to say, what level of transparency can we add to what we do? And so Ed Felton worked on this, and um, I think Ellen um, from v Visa, you know, really good people got together and helped to put together uh, this, uh, th this kind of transparency report uh, to try and overcome this, the feelings that NSA could subvert the process, had subverted the process and could again subvert the process and try to build it in a way, rebuild the process in a way that uh, that won't happen again. Uh, that's not to say that it won't, but uh, you know, I think that they took a, a, a pretty good approach considering the uh, um, uh, potential harm to the NIST name that came from that, so. Great, a any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Ari uh, one more time for coming. Thank you. Thanks.